Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for taking the time to join our virtual uh, teacher workshop. So the teacher workshop is uh, titled The Global Response to COVID-19, uh, Reopening of K-12 Schools in South Korea. So just to give you a brief overview of today's workshop, it will uh, focus on uh, the safe reopening of schools after shutdown in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in South Korea. Uh, the speaker, Sarah Kim, will be discussing the challenges faced by K-16 educational system during the process, as well as the safety measures that were put in place. Uh, as the U.S. aims to reopen schools in the fall, uh, I, I believe that South Korea's uh, experience would provide an example of how to manage holding physical classes amidst the pandemic, and also it will help you deal with uh, the potential risks. So I also uh, would like to take uh, the pleasure of welcoming our guest speaker, Sarah Kim. Uh, she's a reporter on the national desk of the Korea Jong Ang Daily, published with the New, uh, New York Times International Edition. She specializes in foreign affairs and security issues at the paper, uh, but also has covered health, education, and social affairs. She is the recipient of the 2019 Foreign Language Newspaper Association of Korea Award for Journalists. Kim has appeared on radio uh, programs, including TBS, Airang, KBS World, and BBC. She organized and co-hosted the 2018 uh, Jeju Forum for Peace and Prosperity Ambassadors Roundtable Session. She has previously worked as an English language instructor in Seoul and a legal assistant in New York. Kim holds a bachelor's degree in history and English from Middlebury College. Welcome, Kim, and uh, I would like to uh, pass on the mic to you now. Thank you very much to Shruti and Amir for the wonderful introduction. And greetings to everybody today from Seoul. It's morning time here <laughs> on Friday. Um, basically, the safe reopening of schools amid the COVID pandemic has been a global challenge and a task for policymakers and educators alike. South Korea, likewise, has gone through similar concerns and debates that the United States is probably going through currently. Like many other countries, Korea suspended our physical classes with the outbreak of the COVID-19 um, in February. And our new school year actually starts in the springtime and would have begun on March 2nd, but was delayed with the coronavirus outbreak. And basically, like many of the schools, other schools out there, in the world, we also unprecedentedly kicked off our new school semester through distance learning or remote classes in April. And following a period of um, watching the flattening of the curve, we eased social distancing regulations in early May, and then we began a phased reopening of K-12 classes starting in late May and through early June, and this brought back nearly 6 million students nationwide back to limited physical classes. Currently, our students have been back in their school rooms at least some days of the week for nearly two months now. Like the United States, Korea is struggling with similar questions on how to prevent health risks without sacrificing the quality of education and the emotional well-being of our students, and we also um, had questions on the right time to open physical classes and went through a period of multiple delays as well. While I am not an educator or a policymaker, I hope to offer a broader multi-angle perspective from the eyes of a journalist who's really covered this process and kind of show you how South Korea took the steps to reopen classes. And as the U.S. tries to reopen schools in the fall time, South Korea's experience may provide just an example of maybe how to manage holding physical classes in the midst of a pandemic while also responding to potential risks in a flexible manner. And um, can we turn the next slide on? And this is a brief timeline. I'm basically we're in July and I wanted to share with you briefly about Korea's COVID-19 trends. If we go to the next slide. Um, you can kind of see how basically January 20th is around the same time that the United States had the patient number one and Korea also had our patient number one around then. And then you can see how we suddenly um, had a spike in cases that's around in late February. And since then we've flattened the curve, as we say. And if you look at this point, this is kind of, um, there was a peak in late in May, and then starting from April, there was sort of a plateau. 
which is why we led to the May um, easing of social distancing in May. And at one point, Korea was the second highest um, country, country with the second highest number of corona cases in the world. And basically, we tried to target this outbreak with aggressive testing, tracing, and treatment. Um, can we go on to the next slide? And one thing I do want to point out is that Korea never went into a full lockdown mode, and we never had an entry ban on countries, um, foreigners visiting the country, except for Wuhan and the Hubei province, the original epicenter of the coronavirus. And I just wanted to share with you, this is the Korea Centers for CDC, pretty much the Korean version of the CDC in the U.S. And basically, we get these updates, daily briefings, and daily figures, and daily updates. And as of Thursday, um, Korea has around over 1,400, 14,000 cases and 300 deaths in total. We've tested 1.5 million people. And this is sort of the kind of data, the transparency that our government has been given to giving the public. And in turn, I think there has been a lot of civic cooperation, um, which has helped kind of fight against this pandemic. And if we go on to the next slide, I think I would like to go more into the details of how we went from going to distance learning to back to physical classes. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll share with you a little bit about the process. We had a three stage kind of process in which on May, April 9th, middle school third years and high school seniors in Korea for the first time kicked off their school semester through remote classes. And the rest of the grades sort of came in line through the rest of the month through April 20th. And our remote learning system, I think will be very similar to what you have in the States. Um, we had interactive classes through, you know, video conferences like Zoom. And then we have pre-recorded online lectures, which was given by teachers and also um, our educational broadcaster, EBS, which is kind of like PBS in the United States, I would say. And then of course, there are the school assignments for students to complete. And if we go on to the next slide, basically there has been, you know, I think we've faced the exact same troubles that you might have in the States, um, you know, Students find it difficult to concentrate. They want to be back amongst their peers. And there were a little bit, a few glitches in the beginning, getting everybody loaded onto the server at the same time. But at the same time, I think Korea with our high speed internet and also having um, great access to smart devices, for example, is a country that probably is very well prepared for distance learning, remote learning. And um, we had major companies like Samsung Electronics or LG donate smart devices for um, students of lower income families or those with multiple siblings. However, I think we all realized that this is not a sustainable system and then students needed to be back in school to get a better quality education. And also parents were sort of dying because you know they were still going to work and then they had to oversee this online education of their students. One thing I do want to point out is that for the youngest students, the kindergartners didn't go back and then like the first and second graders Instead of watching or going online, they could watch their lessons through television. And then, so this is sort of the background. And basically, if you go on to the next slide, our education ministry announced the plan to return to school um, after we eased our social distancing campaign on May 6th and then introduced the daily life distancing measures as we call it. So this is sort of just an easing of social distancing. Um, basically, like with remote learning, we had a three-step or three-phase manner to bring back nearly 6 million students back to their campuses for the first time since the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, we also faced delays in this process. For example, our schedule was pushed back, pushed back one week because there was a new cluster of infections which was related to Itaewon clubs in Seoul, which is the metropolitan area. It's kind of like a downtown hotspot. And at one point there was even a petition, a Blue House petition, which is to the president with over 200 signatories calling for a delay in school openings. So we had a lot of concerns here as well on whether it is safe to send our children back to schools. And 
um, I guess if you go on to the next slide. But nonetheless, I think by May 20th, the senior in high school returned to physical classes. And this is pretty much 80 days after the new school was supposed to kick in. And even on the day of the return to school for these seniors, hundreds of schools, including schools in Incheon, were not able to go back or they had to close down schools suddenly or send some students back home because there are coronavirus cases um, concerns. And this goes back to what I mentioned earlier. There was a um, cluster and related to intern clubs. And then what happened was that an intern resident, Wincheon is pretty much right next to Seoul, a private academy instructor lied during the epidemiologic um, tracings process and then didn't say that he was a private academy instructor. So he got a student infected and then that student was a senior in high school in Incheon. So this led to a little panic in the beginning. So some schools in the related districts in Incheon, not all of Incheon, but just some districts shut down their schools first and had an early day. But basically um, this kind of started the process of getting students back to school and it's sort of a flexible kind of way for schools to be able to shut down if there is a related case in that area, but other schools can continue on. So basically we saw even kindergartners come back to schools and um, in this process, in phase two, in the second week, basically on June 3rd, there was another 520 schools who were not able to open. However, this was also related to some cases in Seoul and there was a scare because one student went to a museum park and then later found out that she was, um, she tested positive and then she was also a high schooler. And because of that scare, um, that was one of the reasons why some schools in Seoul are shut down during that reopening. But if we go on to the next slide, nonetheless, by June 8th, some 6 million students were back in their schools. Of course, this was not in the way that students would have been back in their schools in the past. However, the current landscape of classes amid the pandemic includes stringent guidelines for social distancing, mask wearing, and also schools are adopting a rotating class system and a hybrid in-class and online approach to lesson. So if we go on to the next slide, Government guidelines here requires high schools in Seoul, Incheon, and Gyeonggi, which is like, I guess we can compare it to the New York tri-state area. They have to run classes um, at two thirds of their capacities and kindergartens through middle schools are required to run it at one third capacity to limit the number of people in school at a certain period of time. 12th graders in the Seoul metropolitan area, they go to school every day of the week because they're preparing for college and that's considered the most essential year. And then 10th and 11th graders, they spend alternating days of the week um, in classrooms and then taking online lessons. However, majority of students outside the school, outside the Seoul area go to school every day and it seems to be working okay. And currently this is the first semester and then this rotating class system is going expected to continue through and for the fall semester, but that also is in discussion right now. If and the discussion is about if there are more students who will be allowed back in classes. And if we go into the next slide, um, I guess we can kind of go into more detail about how there are many creative ways to get with social distancing. And in, for example, in major cities, schools, students go to school in staggered schedules to minimize physical contact at the gate. And then students will also have to fill out their self-diagnosis forms before the start of school on whether they have any symptoms or whether they visited any COVID hotspots. And then one tick of a box could mean that they have to stay home. And that's also consideration out of their peers as well. And we've also seen how the Temperatures are, are checked by thermal imaging cameras or sometimes the um, temperature check manually, but that's kind of a daily routine. Also during lunchtime, you can see that students are prohibited from chatting and they're separated by plexiglass dividers or they're spaced out, you know, two meters or so. 
for younger students, you will see that in the stickers in the hallways, they have to, um, they have stickers on the floors for them to kind of see where they're supposed to be um, spaced out. And then this is when they have break time or they have to go to the bathroom. This can serve as guidelines. But at the end of the day, there can be um, their children. So it might be difficult to keep up with such stringent quarantine measures. And then right now, um, I guess I can sh the image shows how st students are wearing masks and they're also getting their thermal temperatures checked. And the education ministry, before students went back to school, introduced the seven classroom guidelines, um, like such as wearing masks all the time, keeping windows open, wiping desks, staying home if you're sick, washing hands. I think these are measures that are similarly shared in the United States and, well, I don't know about the mask wearing part, but I hope that part is stressed more because I think in Korea, we've seen the effects of wearing masks and despite the difficulties, because it's very hot and humid in the summertime here, students are still trying to keep their masks on and teachers as well. And that really helps with the um, getting through every single day in a safe manner. And if we go on to the next slide, I guess I talked earlier about how we struggled to figure out when the right timing to return to schools was. As I mentioned, we had at least five or so delays in the news starting the new school semester school year. And even when we were trying to return to physical classes, there were new cases pop new clusters popping up near where the schools are, which led to a lot of fear. However, our education minister Yoon Hae said on May 22nd. May 27th, uh, it's not possible to provide sufficient education to students just through remote classes alone. And if we don't open physical classes under our current COVID-19 management system, Korea may never or may not be able to reopen the school at all this year. So I think what we did was we had to look at the long haul. First, we had to make sure that we were in a situation where our healthcare system was able to um, sustain or um, not be overwhelmed by cluster infections should schools re um, reopen again. And then second of all, we had to kind of acknowledge that this is a long haul. The pandemic is not going to go away anytime soon and until the vaccine is made, but we know that's not going to happen probably this year. So they were trying to come up with a sustainable plan. And thirdly, as um, our minister said, it was basically we had to also consider the education quality for our students and online classes were not enough to give them the quality of education that they would need. And the picture here is, um, you can see is basically a lot of people lining up in front of a test center, which is actually a public health center in one of the districts in Seoul. And this is after the amusement park, um, I guess, case the high schooler who went to the amusement park the Sunday before she was supposed to go back to school, which led to the scare and a lot of people got tested right away. And then there wasn't really. Also that girl, she turned out to, it turned out to be sort of a false negative or I think she recovered and it was a floating virus. So that worked out okay in the end. So that's the other part with the healthcare system also has to come with aggressive ability to test and make sure that people are able to are not infected. And if someone is infected, you should be able to isolate that case. And I guess um, if we go on to the next slide, I just wanted to touch briefly upon um, a breakdown of cases in Korea. What I wanted to show you, you don't have to look at it in detail, but basically, as I mentioned earlier, we do aggressive testing and also tracing of the cases. And so this is our KCDC website. This is the English version of it. So if you look into the website, it gives you a breakdown of all the different cities and regions, major cities. And you can see how many cases are related to each region. And also the pie graph shows you kind of how, where the clusters are coming from. So that's another important aspect of returning back to school and returning back to the um, daily life is that you have to be able to trace the cases and also isolate them in order to prevent community transmission. 
And in the case of Korea, our major cases, maybe half the cases, maybe six, 7,000 cases were in the city of Daegu um, that broke out in March, in late February and March. And it was related to a religious sect called Shincheonji, and it spread widely amongst the church members. And because of that, and because of testing, we were able to um, lock down Daegu, which is the exception when I said that we didn't have lockdowns in Korea. And then the second sort of cluster of infections happened in April with in clubs in Itaewon, which is sort of like the hot spot, like foreigners hang out there and party there. And that kind of was the second time, that was when the second epicenter was sort of in Seoul in the metropolitan area and led to some concerns. And being, having that ability, I think, really is important in the process of going back to school and having students back in their classes. And if we go on to the next slide, um, and this was our government's social distancing guidelines that was kind of introduced earlier this month. And you can see three levels. Korea is in level one, basically, when we have less than 50 cases a day. Um, Thursday, we actually had a record low in the past month of 18 cases, of which around 11 were from imported cases. So that's a low, but generally we've been averaging around 40, 50 cases in the past month or so, even 60. And then you can see that in the level one stage, we can have physical classes and online classes, um, the system that we are currently in on right now. If we go to level two, if there are more than maybe like 50 to 100 cases for two consecutive weeks, then there will be a limitation to the physical classes. And then level three is when we have a spike in cases all of a sudden. And in that, we will revert back to the remote learning system and then physical classes will be suspended for the time being. So this kind of happened earlier this month. So we have a multi-level kind of synergy going on between the central government and our education ministry, and then the local government and our local office education offices, for example, the Seoul education superintendent, and then also on the school level as well. And before I go ahead, I think um, this kind of summarizes how Korea reopened their K to 12 class, K to 12 classes, and we've been kind of experiencing this for the past two months. So it was trial and error. However, I think we sort of have a system going on right now. And for before I move on to the university section, I thought maybe I can open the floor to um, any questions that you might have. If any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, you can ask the question. Or uh, there's also a chat option at the bottom, so uh, you can also ask your questions through the chat option. Or I can go on to the university section and then collect questions at the end altogether. So um, basically, if we move on to universities in Korea, I think the situation here is probably similar to what's going on in the United States. Basically, we also have a hybrid system where universities can choose to have a blend of online classes and small in-person classes for necessary courses and lab work. And basically, some of the biggest issues here are tuition, for example. And there has been widespread demand from students who want their tuitions refunded. And basically, our education ministry said that this is up to the individual universities to decide. However, we know the university position is, um, you know, professors are working almost double time sometimes if they have to do remote classes and also deal with some of the physical classes. But for students, not everybody, for example, lives in Seoul. And then if they want to live in Seoul, they have to find housing and um, 
um, it's a big hassle, or if they want to just come in to take physical exams, that's another hassle as well. And they believe that they're not getting the quality of education that they signed up for. And this is very much similar to what's the debates that's going on in the United States, I believe. What's different is that, I guess, Kongguk University, which is one of the universities in Seoul, offered a partial refund. And, um, but a lot of the other colleges have said that that's not, a, that's not an option. And then a group of Korean university students recently joined together to file a class action law school against the Ministry of Education and their schools seeking for partial tuition refunds. However, we'll have to kind of see how that goes. And also our universities are preparing for the fall semester as well. So um, we'll see how that plays into this. But going on to more about the COVID concerns, uh, phys returning to physical classes in, for example, a Seoul university, it's very compact and there have been concerns about transmissions through in-person classes or exams. And we actually had cases where there were um, infections resulting from in-class or physical exam taking. And this was at the Kachan University in Gyeonggi back in May, and that led to a huge scare and it was luckily contained through testing and isolation and contact tracing. However, this has led to debates on, is it safer to take classes, um, exams online, for example? However, there was also concerns about cheating online, for example, and we've had a case where a group of um, 90 or so medical students at Ina University in Incheon, they were involved in unmasked cheating online, Basically, what happened was that um, they were able to gather in like groups of two to nine, and then they tried to take the exams together and share the answers. And it's an issue because medical students, um, they're medical students, so their ethics are very important. However, at the same time, if you hear the students' perspective, you know, they were struggling with online classes and then this whole pandemic and suddenly an exam is thrown at them and they're basically not prepared to take an exam. So that goes into the question of quality of education through remote learning. And basically um, another key issue is also how to bring back international students to the campus safely. And most um, because of the various um, countries' entry bans and quarantine measures. A lot of the foreign students are back in their home countries and learn, look, learning remotely. However, eventually we would like to see the foreign international students return. As I mentioned earlier, Korea never had an entry ban on um, visitors. However, we have a mandatory 14 day self-isolation, self-quarantine period. You can, if you're a Korean national, you can self-isolate at home or we also have facilities where people can reside in for 14 days during the incubation period of the virus. However, that will also lead to some domestic concerns about you know, imported cases. So far, we believe that the imported cases are being contained through our aggressive testing at the airports. However, if tens of thousands of students return, that's another question. And I know that such issues are also being discussed in the United States. Um, the issue of international students. On the other side, we know that there has been concern about visas, giving visas to um, foreign students. And there was a controversy about if a university does not have in-person classes, then visas won't be issued to the international students. Though I think um, that has led to major protests and you know, overturning of that kind of stipulation. And I know from the Korean perspective as well, that there are people who wanted to go to the United States to study. And I know college or high school seniors were very unsure about what's going to happen in the future because they don't know if their school in the United States is reopening physical classes or if it's just going to be remote learning. So it's kind of sad for them as well because they got into the school of your dreams and then they're not able to get there. So that's another thing that we are trying to look at. Um, currently, and I guess universities are a little bit different because they have more autonomy to choose individually how they're going to approach this process. But if we go on to the next slide, 
um, yes, um, this is just a, sh a photo of showing how the students were protesting and wanting us um, wanting a refund of their tuition. And then if we go to the next slide, um, basically in the overall kind of um, overview of how we look at this process, I think some questions to ask before opening, reopening schools is does the local government have some sort of testing, tracing, and isolation system in place? Ideally, we would like to have a central government who can give the specific guidelines, but I know that, um, for example, in the United States, there is great local leadership as well who has been guiding this kind of process as well. And then secondly, does the school have an adaptable hybrid in-class and on class online approach to lessons? Um, can it have rotating class systems or another means to socially distance the student body is another question that I should ask. And I guess, for example, in Seoul, students are, our schools are in closed groups with each other. So I think close communications within that neighborhood is also very important as well. And then this comes down to, I think, something that pertains to a lot of people here, like how will the teachers reinforce social distancing in classrooms? I actually have experience teaching um, English around 10 years ago, I think, in Korea. Back then, we had a smaller um, infectious disease, the hand, foot, mouth disease, I guess. And I know how, especially younger children, are not able to socially distance themselves and abide by hygiene rules, no matter how much you try to reinforce it. Um, and then older students are another sort of I mean, they're more responsive and a lot of them are very responsible, but at the same time, some of them are more rebellious. For example, we've seen in Korea, high school students who went to the karaoke bars, went to internet cafes, places where they're not supposed to be social distancing or places where they were not social distancing right before returning school and jeopardizing the entire student body and forcing their school to shut down for the day. So that's another thing to consider. And are students ready to commit to checking their own health, being self-aware, wearing masks, being apart from their peers? I know maybe the first day back, it seems doable, but as time passes on, we all know that this is very difficult. And I know that this is going to be a lot in the long run. And another thing to ask is, does the local community and healthcare system have the capacity to deal with a cluster of infections? Um, I wanted to just, briefly share with you figures in Korea. Basically, um, since we started our schools in May, we've had 111 cases, COVID cases among children. And then if we break down these figures, elementary students were around 47 cases. And this is the highest number, surprisingly. And there, you know, there has been a lot of talk about how younger students don't um, get infected as much, for example. And then 23 were middle and high school students. And then there were even 18 kindergartners who got infected. And most of the transmission happened outside of school, half were from their family members. But then others got infected in karaoke bars, as I mentioned, internet cafes, uh, even private academies, you know, where they study after school. And so far, it seems like one Taejeon elementary school student got infected in school, but we haven't seen any widespread infection of school happening within of students within the school, which could be a testament to the social distancing measures um, working. But that is also something that we have to watch and see. And Korea is going to go into summer vacation period, a sh probably shortened summer vacation period, and then students will be going out and doing other things and coming be coming back into school. So that's another cautionary time as well. And I guess I would like to just wrap things up by saying that we are living in a new normal where schools may have to shut down at any given moment because of possible new infection cases. And this could mean that what the school has to do is conduct school-wide COVID-19 testing and then switch to learning remotely for the time being and having that sort of flexibility. And of course, in Korea, wearing the mask in the hot weather has been a challenge. And then there is another worry because in the fall time, there could be the flu season and the second wave of infections, for example. So we're also always um, on 
stand by to be prepared for that. And I guess another issue is that teachers are being burdened by this double workload of trying to manage physical classes and then also holding um, online lessons and keeping up with the health safety. And, you know, it's sometimes a thankless job as sometimes it's a job where um, the, the safety and happiness of the students gives, you know, bountiful returns. And the parents at the same time have been worried about sending off their, their children off to school. However, they're recognizing their limitations of online learning and most parents that I've spoken to are basically happy to be sending their students or their children back to school because they, they know that it's very necessary for them. And lastly, I just want to say that though, despite all of this fiasco that I've talked to you about how there have been some delays in returning back to school, their um, school life is kind of not as bright and happy as it would have been. They're just glad to be back amongst their peers. And even if it means wearing the mask, you know, socially distancing, washing their hands all the time, I think for the emotional happiness of the students, having schools open again was, it was a blessing even amidst this pandemic. And I'll just like to wrap things up here and open the floor to any questions. Or uh, if we go back, I just wanted to share um, the previous photo. Um, yeah, that photo right there, it's kind of a COVID-19 drill going on in a high school, basically. So, I mean, we have fire drills and earthquake drills. So I think we're in an era where we are going to have to have COVID drills where students kind of prepare to um, deal with if there is a case within the school. So this is not real. This is a mock kind of drill. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a QR code uh, for the survey. So all you need to do is open the camera in your phone and then you'll be redirected to the link. And you can also um, click the link right above. I think you have to type it in your browser and then you will be able to uh, access the survey. So please do fill out and uh, provide your feedback. It's very valuable for us. Uh, also in the meantime, if you have any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or you can also ask it in the chat box. So we have uh, a couple of minutes for Q and A's. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Or should I turn on my camera? Or uh, it's it's up to you. But we can hear you clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Um, well, um, thank you, Sarah, so much for such an informative session. Um, and um, I guess I just have a one question. Um, because of um, related to my 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 research interest in uh, in South Korean K twelve context, um, which has to do with the high school seniors. Um, as for me, um, as being as CS, CSAT being the the single most important exam or process that's happening in the high school, or even like. To cover the whole K twelve system, um, as the as a as the the single most example, uh, um, uh, the single most ex uh, important or significant results um, that that the that the, the the Korean education system is making um, making deal out of. So, with um, not just the, the schools but the parents and students. Um, so I was wondering how, um, if there are any talks or um, or the public discourses um, around how the CSAT of this year is going to happen, or um, like with the with the presence of the the mixed um, mixture of hybrid and online classes with the physical classes. Um, thank you for the question. It's a great question. And um, CSATs, which can be compared to the US SATs, however, it's more of a cumulative um, test examination, which basically determines what college students get into. And basically, you can say it's no exaggeration to say that Korean high schoolers 
spend all their three years um, preparing for this one exam. And as you mentioned, the CSATs are kind of the most important exams. And it's also why high school seniors are very stressed in Korea. However, um, basically, the exams are held usually in November. And because of the pandemic, it has been pushed back to early December. And at the same time, as you mentioned, because high school education um, is, or high school senior education is most important. They're the class, they're the one year that um, students are going to school every single day. However, is this enough because their classes have been disrupted early on with the pandemic and with the remote learning? Mm, there has been concerns about that as well. And basically what's going to happen is that um, I guess They've had, um, I think they've already taken a mock exam, but there have been a series of mock exams that lead up to the CSATs. And in this process, I think that will kind of test out if the social distancing exams um, kind of system works. And also if the students are really ready to do this. And we'll also have to kind of um, see how the students are sort of doing outside of school learning. Korea, I think, does a lot of private academy learning or private education pretty much. So we know that a lot of students, even while they were not going to school, were actually going to private academies in the midst of this pandemic, which is not always the best social distancing um, location either. However, you are very right in this um, in pointing out that the CSATs are a major concern and also a major concern for the education ministry and parents and the schools as well and for the students themselves. Um, whether a nationwide exam of this level held on one day can be held safely with social distancing guidelines, uh, we will have to make sure that that happens in the meanwhile. However, I mean, Korea has had the voting system and, and they've done social distancing pretty well. And I think by the time we get to November, December, um, they would have figured out how to do this in a safe manner nationwide. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, it did really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jay, if you had any other questions, you're, I think you're the only participant and you can ask her any other question you have. Um, I guess that was pretty much it. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you though for the question. I had a question, Sarah. I know I'm the moderator, but it's a really interesting topic. So, uh, uh, what about the assessments in the schools, like K to 12? Have they changed, or are they still this following the same guidelines like before? Assessments in terms of grading. Yeah, in terms of grading. Yeah, basically, um, I guess things would be more flexible with the lower grades. But for example, in high schools, I mentioned, um, I think the second phase of some high schoolers returning back to school, the first day back, they have to take mock exams. <laughs> so, and a lot of times such mock exams um, take up a lot of the grading system. We have a very rote, rote grading system, or rote system in Korea where it's yeah. you know, by the book learning. It's not all about the seminar style discussions. So exams make up a lot of the grades. And so there are concerns that say, if you were sick or out for one mock exam, and what mm -hmm. happens then there are several mock exams so like or several exams so that other exam would make up for most of the grade i think there's sort of a flexible approach as well there um, okay. I, um just going to school itself is a task i feel very bad for these students who are trying to get through their academic year um, and do well on top of that kudos to them i guess <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for answering that question. Uh, so if uh, there are no other questions, I think we can wrap up here. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was a really very insightful uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, to the participants as well uh, for being here. Yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, if you wanna, we'll stay on for a couple of minutes if you have any other questions. Uh, for the participants, please don't forget to uh, fill in the survey. We really appreciate your feedback. And uh, 
we hope to see you in our future events. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for hosting this opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah.